And all the people said, Amen. 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 Thank you. This sermon is for y'all three this morning. Come on, I'm just kidding. Thank you. I tell you, I appreciate it. It looks like we got the band back together here this morning. Balcony's full, and you're full, and I really, really, really appreciate you being here this morning. Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. <clears throat> Desire your prayers and your patience this morning. <clears throat> it's a little bit of a struggle, but I'll be okay. God's got me. Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. There's a story of a 35 year old insurance salesman, and uh, he went into the Vision uh, Rehabilitation Clinic in Providence, uh, Providence Rhode Island. And he had only a 1%, uh, they, they called it a 1% vision uh, since the age of 10. And basically he had gone through life uh, in a shadow of gray. Maybe some of you can uh, understand what I mean by that. And then at this uh, vision rehabilitation clinic, uh, the, the doctors and the technicians uh, dropped in what they call uh, uh, magnifier glasses um, to this gentleman. And they, they slipped them in place, and as soon as they dropped and, and they were slipped in place, this man stood up in amazement. And he said, praise God, I can finally see. Praise God. After all these years, finally, a miracle. He said, this is absolutely the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. And in just a few moments, he picked up the phone, and he called his wife. And he said, honey, I am on the way home to finally see what you really look like. <laughs> now, I share that because what we've been doing for the past, I'll say, four weeks or four meetings is we have been going through Mark... Um, Six a little bit, a lot in seven, and we're, we're really drilling down now in Mark 8. How many of you remember that? Say amen. amen. So we're, we're in Mark 8, and the path that we have been going down, uh, I am excited to announce that this morning is where I really feel like that God would have us to be. I could have just started it here about two weeks ago. But, Mr. Gene, I feel like it was important for us to, to pay attention to, to, some of those, to some of the events uh, that Mark described to us about our Lord. So, basically, if you'll allow me, in our traveling, in our journey of Tyre, Sidon, um, and all the places, the, the corners and the edges of the Sea of Galilee with Christ and his disciples... We are now, we have now arrived, church, at Bethsaida. And if you're physically able, would you please stand in reverence to the reading of God's Word in Mark chapter 8, starting in verse 22. Mark 8, 22. If you're there, say amen. amen. If you brought your Bible from home, say I did. Amen. The Bible says, then he came to Bethsaida. This is Jesus. And they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of town. Now, if you mark in your Bible, I want you to underscore by the hand and led out of town. Now, this is the cool part. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. Now, church, pay attention. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands, the, Jesus put his hands on the blind man's eyes again. And made him look up. 
underscore made him look up. And he was restored and saw everyone clearly. Then he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town, nor tell anyone in the town. Father, in Jesus' name, Father, I pray for your spirit to move this morning. Father, I, I ask you to help me to draw breath this morning. Lord, I pray I don't call for another time during this sermon. Lord, I need you this morning. However, I'm only here because you've allowed it. Father, I pray now in the words of John the Baptist, may I decrease and you increase. Father, may the people this morning, Father, from the balcony to the choir loft, Father, may they be receptive for what you have to say this morning. Father, we love you. Thank you for loving us. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> In verse 22, now this morning, as we've been doing just a little bit, I want you to get comfortable this morning, okay? I want you to get comfortable, and I pray that, if they, I pray that the Holy Spirit makes somebody uncomfortable this morning. But I want you to be able to see uh, uh, what, what is going on here, why we have spent so much time getting to Mark 8, 22. Arriving at Mark 8, 22. What is so special about this miracle of Jesus? Well, I think there's a lot of things that are special about this miracle of Jesus. If you're listening, say, I am. In verse 22, I want you to look, and the delivery this morning is going to be a little bit different than what you're used to with me. The first thing I want you to do is I want you to look at verse 22. We see the man arriving at Jesus. We see him arriving at Jesus. Now, this is outside the town of Bethsaida. It is outside the town. It is not in the town of Bethsaida, and we'll get to that in just a moment. So these people have brought these individuals. It was not the disciples. These people have brought this blind man to Jesus. Now, look at me. Listen to me, please. If, if, if you don't get all this, it's, it's, there's going to be some issues. It is a, we're, we wonder sometimes, why did they bring him to Jesus? Well, first of all, they had to bring him. He was blind. He didn't know where Jesus was. He didn't know exactly, exa and this is just elementary, he didn't know exactly where Jesus was. He couldn't see where he was. I'm sure he heard the commotion of the crowd and everybody, but they had to bring the man to Jesus. Why? Well, there's two thought processes here, and it could be that you're in one of those two thought processes this morning. The men, the people, the individuals, probably of that town, from around that time, from around that town, did not believe that Jesus was who he said he was. So they want to, if you'll allow me for just a moment, and I don't think that's the thought process that I'm, that I'm baking on here, and I'll explain why in just a moment. They didn't believe Jesus was who he said. So in other words, they were going to, as a, a, an elderly person would say, they were going to bring G this man to Jesus so they could make sport of Jesus that he wasn't who he said he was. Or there's another thought process that the blind man did not have faith in Jesus. Now, I want to ask you a question this morning. Are you in one of those situations this morning? Are you really in one of those situations this morning? Do you, you have things going, we have things going on in our life. And we'll tell everybody about them, but we won't take them to the king of kings. We won't take our problems to Jesus. And the problem with that is we're spiritually blind of who Jesus really is. My prayer this morning when we're done huffing and puffing, my prayer this morning is that just like the man in Providence, Rhode Island, I want us to see as a church, as a born-again bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, red brick Baptist church this morning to see and to leave here looking at Jesus for who he really is. And we don't do that sometimes because we're spiritually blind. We see the men bring the, the, the man to Jesus. Well, if you remember in Mark 7, 33, the deaf mute man, as we would, it would say back then, oh, it's not PC today, but the man that was deaf and dumb. The Bible says that, they, that he was brought to Jesus. And that was the miracle where Jesus uh, uh, put his fingers in the man's ear and, he's, and he, he locks the lava. And he said, open up. And the man could hear. But not only do we see in verse 22 him arriving at Jesus, I want you to look at verse 23. We see him guided by Jesus. Watch this. Now, this will make a Baptist shout. 
In verse 23, look at this now. So if you allow me, the Bible says, look at your Bible. It says, so he, he is Jesus. So if you allow me, so Jesus took the blind man by the hand, by the hand, and led him out of town. I love this verse. Could, could you imagine this for just a second? Watch this now. It's safe to say there's individuals. It's safe to say there's a crowd, and there's the doubt, and there's the despair, and there's this blind man that can't see a thing. Now watch this, Justin. Let me. We didn't practice this. Watch this. Come with me. Watch, watch this now. Y'all know I'm animated. Look what we see Jesus doing. Yes. Look what we see Jesus doing. We see Jesus bringing a blind man. Thank you. We see Jesus bringing a blind man away from everybody. And it's something else when Jesus gives us individual care. Somebody say amen. He was giving this man his own divided attention, care, and prayer. It was Jesus. It was Jesus taking care of this man. He says, I'm going to get you away from the crowd. Now, that'll preach. He says, I'm going to get you away from the crowd. Come here with me. And we, and we see this compassionate Jesus taking care and pulling this man. We see Jesus guiding the man. Oh, my gracious. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Brian, Psalm 23, please. Watch this. Watch this. I, I know you know it, but let's just let's just get some. Let's just pray and praise this morning. Y'all okay with that? Psalm twenty three. I want you to look at this. Uh, matter of fact, come on now. Here we go. Watch this. Watch this now. The Lord. Say it with me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Now watch this. I'm interrupt you, but I want us to get this. He makes me to lie down in green pasture. You know, sometimes the Lord makes us to lie down. He makes me to lie down in green pasture. Watch this. The hand of Jesus. The hand of Jesus. He's guiding us. Watch this. Say it with me. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they're present with us there. They're in Jesus' hands. Amen. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before. He's there. He's there. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. That's consecration. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, say it with me, church. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Isaiah 41, 13, Margin Scripture. If you're not walking with Jesus this morning, if your hand is not in his hand this morning, I want you to write down Isaiah 41, 13. The Bible says, for I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, fear not, for I will help you. So we see the individual care and compassion of Jesus. But why did he lead him away from the town? Bless you. Why did he lead him away from the town? I want to share with you that Bethsaida had already had judgment pronounced on it. It already had judgment pronounced on Matthew eleven twenty one 21, margin scripture. Matthew eleven twenty one. 21, the Bible says, this is Jesus talking. Woe to you, Corzin. Well, listen to these words. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloths and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than it will be for you. This town, <coughs> I'm going to say it like this. 
they had already had all their chances. And they were not going to receive. You hearing me, church? They had already had all their chances. And they were not going to receive anymore. Jesus says, let me get you away from this town. Because being in that town could have hindered that man. Being in that town could have hindered his faith. Sometimes we just need to get away from the crowd. Max Lucado has said, he said, there's a lot of paintings of the God-man. How many of you have ever seen a picture or a painting of Jesus? Raise your hand. You ever seen a picture, a painting of Jesus? Raise your hand. There's a lot of them. The Last Supper. Hello. Uh, you, we've seen uh, paintings of Jesus in the arms of Mary as a baby. Well, I, I love the artist. I don't know who it is, but there's a certain artist that does pencil drawings of Jesus laughing. I thought that was pretty cool with the children and stuff. But you know a painting you've never seen? One of Jesus spitting. <laughs> Come on now. You ever seen a picture of Jesus spitting? There's so many places I could go with this, but I don't want to get voted out. <laughs> can, can, can I ask you something? Can you just, you got to get there with me for just, can I have a little bit of fun? But think about it. You get there just a minute with Jesus and the blind man. And Jesus building up some saliva in his mouth. Can I ask you a question? I want you to do me a favor. How many of you remember growing up? Now, y'all think I'm going to be dirty, for lack of better words, but I'm not. I'm not being gross. I want you to listen to me a second. How many of you growing up remember you having something, you were a child, you having something on the corner of your mouth, and your mama licked her finger, and she rubbed the corner of your mouth? My mama used to do that all the time. She'd reach in the back. Can I get a witness in the house of God? Look yonder. Mama's spit could take rust off a car bumper. But wait a minute. Jason, that's disgusting. No, it's scripture. Watch this. Mama would do that and wipe the mouth. That was the nastiest thing I've ever had done in my life. I'd say, Mama, stop it. But it's exactly, it's exactly what Jesus done. Amen. Let me tell you, Bosch and Lomp didn't have anything on Jesus' spit. Jason, why did he spit? Well, it's, you, you need to know and you need to realize that spit had medicinal purposes in biblical days. Especially in China, by the way. But Jesus used spit, I know of, three times. John 9, the blind man from birth. See, this gentleman wasn't blind from birth. He had gotten blind. It was later in life that he lost his sight. I'll prove that to you in just a second. But the gentleman at the Pool of Salaam, Jesus and made mud pies. In, the, in, John, in Mark 7, the deaf man, Jesus spit. And here, why did he spit? It goes back to that individual care he was given, Mr. Sonny. See, when, you were, when this gentleman was blind, I, I thought, Brenda, I thought how I could say this and not make everybody gross out, but I can't think of another word. His eyes had crusted together. I want you to get there with me, please. His eyes had crusted together. And that little bit of moisture and him touching his eye released that film, released that crust. Now watch this. Not only do we have him We have Jesus and the blind man, and he's rubbed his eyes. And it's a sermon for the blind man. But it's a sermon for us today. See, not only was he arriving at Jesus, not only was he guided by Jesus, he was questioned by Jesus. Jesus looked at him, and he asked him a question. Look with me, please. And when he had spit on his eyes, and put his hands on him. He asked him, 
if he saw anything. What do you see? What do you see? And this is not in the Bible, but I'm sure it was very fuzzy. But the man gave him an answer. He said, I see men like trees. If you're listening, say, I am. I see men like trees walking. This is the scripture that tells me he used to could see. Because if he'd been blind since birth, he didn't know what men looked like. He didn't know what trees looked like. So when you study that verse, this man had become blind later in life. Or not at birth, I should say. So he knew what it was like to be able to see at earlier time. We, we got to get this. See, it's partial blindness. It's partial blindness. And I think not only is that a message for the man, but it's a message for the church today. It's a message for the church today. It's a message for Soldier Bay today. See, there was a time when everybody that was saved, that is saved today, there was a time in your life that, boy, you really, you really were excited about your salvation. And, and it's kind of like Paul said in 13, 12, 1 Corinthians 13, 12, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but face to face, and he said, Paul was talking about there the, 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 the imperfect state of believers as to the knowledge of this life and then the life that's going to come. We don't know everything there is to know. We don't know everything there is to know as a believer. But there's things that happen in our life that it kind of dampens us. It kind of puts our fire out. It, it kind of makes us partially blind. We're kind of like this man. There was a time we could see clearly, and we knew exactly what had happened in our life. The choir just sang about it. Boy, we had a story. <laughs> we had a story, and we told that story. We're not saved to sit. We're saved to serve. Amen. We're saved to love. As a matter of fact, somebody has said we're saved to gather, to grow, and then to go out. We're saved and, but to some people, that's just it. We're saved and satisfied. And we think we've done God a favor by coming here on Sunday morning and sitting in a padded pew. Preaching time. And we think that's it. There, there was a time I remember growing up that uh, people used to have a license tag or, uh, or, or a bumper sticker. And, and now today I see it every now and again. I always think about it. But it's, it, it, it reads, God is my co-pilot. If God's your co-pilot, you're in the wrong seat. God should be our pilot. Amen. And let me tell you something. When you move God from the pilot seat to the co-pilot seat, you're spiritually, partially blind, just like this man. That's all we want to do. You see, we, <laughs> this man was led by the hand of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he took him over. He took him away. He spit on his fingers. and he, or he, The Bible says he spit in his eyes. And he put his fingers there to get that film away so he could see. So he could see what? So he could see the light. Amen. And the problem today is sometimes we like the light. Oh, we like the light. But we're not in love with the light. We like it. Well, I like to be able to go to church. I like to be able to, to, to do this or to do that or to, or to do that. But I'm not in the love, we're not in love with the light. And when you're not in love with the light, it's just like the pilot in the co-pilot seat. If there's not light in your life, then there's darkness. And darkness scientifically does not exist. It's just the absence of light. And a matter of fact, Jesus said in John 18, 12, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. When we're not in love with the light, when we're not in love with the light, we're enjoying the darkness. 
John 3, 19, you don't have to turn there, but John 3, 19, margin scripture, watch this. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practices evil, hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. The saddest situations today is when Christians are still living and experiencing deadness and darkness. And God reveals himself to us all the time through nature. You did not set the thermostat outside this morning. God did. Matter of fact, your iPhone or your smartphone or your alarm clock did not wake you up this morning. God did. He reveals himself. He, he reveals himself through scripture. And there's no commitment to reading the scriptures anymore. He reveals himself through the light of the local church. And we don't support the local. This is a hard crowd to preach to because you're here. But there's people that don't support the local church. And I don't care where the church is. I truly believe that God has ordained and orchestrated every church that there is today that serves a risen God. Amen. Because I'm going to tell you right now, what, four or five miles down the road, there's Longwood Baptist Church. Over here, there's that one. Down here, there's this one. But guess what? God has placed him there to meet and reach and teach people that maybe we couldn't. There's a purpose for every church. And God reveals himself through the local church. You may say, well, Jason, the devil made me do it. Let me tell you something right now. The devil might have a hand in keeping you blind, but your own blindness is your fault. The devil will keep us blind, but our blindness comes from us because it's our will, not God's will. I, I, I wrote this down. I just had an epiphany. It's, it's, listen to this. Y'all calm down. It is strong-willed preferences, not God-willed priorities, that keep us in the dark. We're that strong willed. Y'all know anybody that knows everything? Don't call any name. Socrates says, watch this. Socrates, listen to it. Y'all stop now. Socrates says this, and I'm closing. No, actually, I'm not. I'm going to preach another five minutes, and I'm going to close. Socrates said this. He says, I'm the wisest of the Athenians. You got to get this. Watch this. He said, I'm the wisest of the Athenians. That shocked everybody that heard when Socrates said that because Socrates was a humble man. Now listen to what he said. They said, would you please explain what you just said? If y'all listen, say I am. He said, there are great many Athenians who think they know, and I know that I do not know. And since I know that I do not know, I am the wisest of the Athenians. Let me tell you the problem with our spiritual blindness. When we don't serve, I'm, I'm getting ready to, boy, I'm getting ready to get in trouble. But I'm going to do it. Let me tell you something. When you don't come to church like you're supposed to, when you don't sing in the choir like you're supposed to, when you don't read your Bible like you're supposed to, when you don't pray like you're supposed to, when you're lost as a goose in a snowstorm and the gospel is presented and you do not respond like you're supposed to, when you don't serve like you're supposed to, when you don't love like you're supposed to, when you don't give like you're supposed to, when you don't volunteer like you're supposed to, you're saying, God, I know more than you know. That's exactly what what we're doing when we do not stay in the will of God. God, I know more than you. I know more than you. That's exactly what we're doing. In verse 25. <coughs> in verse 25, watch this. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him Look up. I thought that was so cool. Why is that in there? And he put his eyes, then he put his hands on his eyes again. 
and made him look up. Then God spoke to me. Sometimes we struggle doing God's will when we just want to do our own will. But just like we read earlier or recited earlier, he makes me to lie down in green pasture. Sometimes God makes you to look up. And we don't like it. Can I ask a question? Is he making you look up today? Is he making you through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the word of God, or is he making you look up today that you, you realize this morning that you've got partial blindness, that, that you're, not, you're not doing and you're not where you know God wants you to be? Then he sent him away, 26. Then he sent him away to this house saying, neither go into the town nor tell anyone in the town. The town of Bethsaida, as I've already said, had their chance. Jason, does that mean the blind man couldn't tell anybody? No, that's not what it means. Because he was going back to his house. See, he wasn't from Bethsaida. Because if he was from Bethsaida, then his house wouldn't have been in Bethsaida. And that's why Jesus says, go on, send him away to his house. Neither go into the town nor go to any town. If he lived in Bethsaida, then he couldn't go to his house. But Jesus sent him to his house. Verse 25, and then he said, and then he put his hands on his eyes and again made him look up. And he was restored and saw everyone. Say it with me. Clearly. Amen. This miracle that Jesus performed is unlike no other miracle in the Bible that Jesus performed. What do you mean by that, Jason? This is the only miracle where Jesus healed a man partially and then finished healing him. It's the only one. Why is this different? Matter of fact, Jesus didn't even, somebody say amen. He didn't even have to spit if he didn't want to. He could have just said the word. Why is this different? Sir, ma'am, I want you to realize well, let me do it like this for sake of time. The salvation experience once you are born again, once you are saved. And what does that mean? It means that you're a sinner, you know you're a sinner, you're separated from God, and you're in need of a Savior. And that Savior is the one, He is the only, He is the truth, the life. He is Jesus Christ. And by faith, you believe that. And the progression of this miracle, of this healing, it's kind of like the way it is in salvation, in, in sanctification. It's been said that the Christian walk is not a sprint. It's a marathon. Can I show you something in closing? I just want to encourage you. Mark 8. 27. Watch this now. We're leaving the blind man. I want to show you something. Now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And on the road he asked his disciples, saying to them, Who do men say that I am? So they answered John the Baptist, and some say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. Are y'all listening? Watch this. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. Can I watch this now? Peter didn't believe it, though, when he said it. 
Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. Then he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. 31, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man. So uh, Jesus says, who do you say that I am? He says, you're Jesus. And Jesus starts teaching and preaching his death and his resurrection. And so to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Somebody say amen in the Red Brick Baptist Church. Then he spoke this word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. He's saying, you're Jesus, but Jesus, this death thing, this resurrection thing, no, 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 no. You're not, no. You're Christ. He was partially blind even though he said, you're the Christ. That's right. Come on. And that could be where we are today. Yes. We know. We know. But we really don't know who Jesus is. Sir and ma'am, I'm here to tell you that he is the King of kings and he is the Lord of lords. He is at that, there's going to be a day that at the mention of his name, if you haven't done it, you will do it, and that is your knees going to bow and your tongue's going to confess right. that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I'm here today to ask you and to challenge you and to beg you, if you've never, ever accepted him as your Savior, Lord, sir and ma'am, would you please do it today? Amen. Please do it today. Because if you don't, you're partially blind. You can know him, but just know about him. Can, do you see, musicians, please come. Do you see clearly this morning? Do you see clearly this morning who Jesus is? Have you surrendered? I'm not talking about when it's convenient. I'm not talking about when you up here in front of everybody. I'm talking about have you completely surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ? Sir, ma'am, if you haven't, I just want to encourage you to please do it today. Do you see clearly who Jesus is? Won't you come? Our hymn of invitation is.